Hi, guys, and welcome to another episode. Today, once again, I am joined by Mr. Thomas Cox from, from the EOS Alliance, of also quite prominent in a lot of the governance chats as his role in governance as kind of one of the leaders, as well as um, for, former employee of Block One, and of course, you know, new employee of Strong Block, which is coming up. <laughs> the mysterious strong block about which I can say nothing. <laughs> about which he can say nothing. Uh, hopefully that changes in the near future. But I just wanted to welcome you, welcome you once again. And thank you for coming on again, Thomas. I always love talking to you. And, uh, thank you, likewise. Yeah. And I, I guess we're going to kind of kick it off. We're going to do a bunch of different things and talk about a few different topics here. Um, but I wanted to start off by asking you, I think we've kind of noticed the EOS landscape change quite a bit over the last few months. What is the most prominent thing that really sticks out to you? Um, it, it feels very, for lack of a better word, Bayesian. I hope I'm using that word right. This idea that you like don't know very much, you gather some information, now you know some more, you gather some more information, now you know more. There's this very fast learning loop and things have gone from, you know, full of uh, just a lot of uh, kind of hypey hope and excitement. Like, I wonder how cool it's going to be. I wonder what's going to happen to now. We know what's happening because it, it's happening to us. Uh, and so the unknown is being replaced with the known, which is a very common thing. It's like before you go to your new school and then you're like a month of being at the new school, there are very different experiences. Like you, you don't know what's going to happen. And now it's, uh, I've seen uh, a shake, out of you know block producers a lot of them have dropped out uh, there's been some consolidation and some personnel changes the block producers who've managed to stay reasonably in the money uh, have snapped up uh, staff from those who haven't some independents uh, for instance my two of my favorites uh, blue jays and kev from eos go uh, blue jays got hired by i can't remember which project he's with now is he with warbly I don't remember. He's somewhere cool. He's, he's having a good time. I revise, and, I think. And he, he moved back to Toronto, which is great. Uh, you know, he loves, he loves the Blue Jays so much. He used them as his handle, Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, and Kev uh, went to work for uh, you know, Sweden for a while and then came to work for the Alliance. Uh, you know, continuing his EOS Go work and the EOS Go brand was acquired by EOS Asia and is now their new like public news portal thing. Uh, and I believe EOS Asia hired Katie Roman, uh, who's, of course, this very gifted uh, community personality organizer person. So just, you know, seeing kind of the shifting landscape and how uh, uh, it, it's been like the, the pre-launch period and the early first month after launch was like a, an extended um, uh, audition. And now we're picking teams and we're, we're like going into the big leagues and, you know, things we thought would work didn't work. You know, the thing we now call the Alliance was actually the fourth attempt uh, at creating some sort of focal point entity. Uh, there were three others that were the same basic idea that we need some way to, you know, kind of take this decentralized quasi collective, you know, distributed disparate bunch of people who may not even all speak the same language and, and help them act as an entity so they can do things like govern <clears throat> uh, and so on. Uh, so, you know, the Alliance didn't exist until uh, it was announced in July and then, and then formally launched in August. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're seeing the potential become the actual and things that might have been are being sacrificed for what can be and what will be. Uh, and that's both an opportunity for sadness and mourning because we have to let go of the stuff that's not working. Maybe you try again later. Uh, and also for celebrating and, and doubling down. Uh, so it's, 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 it's like adolescence only compressed into four months. Cause you uh, have to, cause right. It's what growing up is you have to get rid of all the things you could be and sacrifice, you know, all the things you might be on the altar of what you're going to be. Uh, and that's what growing up is. And if you ever see somebody who hasn't, who hasn't, you know, let go of their potential in order to become their actual, they're still a child. Uh, and that's, it's a fine place to be briefly, but you have to move through that period and become who you're going to be. And what, we're, what we are is a fairly high performing, 
uh, a very fertile uh, an interesting space that, you know, <clears throat> still lacks fully functioning governance. It's kind of, I still blame myself at least a little bit for that. I really, really wish I'd made more progress before launch. And we are where we are. I can't beat myself up constantly. Um, but I'm committed to, you know, doing my humble bit to make sure that governance happens. So that's that's been my focus. And I'm seeing people's expectations shift, their awareness shift. Um, I think most people now realize we have to have base layer arbitration. I think that's demonstrable. Um, people occasionally still trot out this phrase, oh, well, you know, it should only be, arbitration should only be for objective things. And I'm like, okay, give me an objective definition of objective. And they can't. It's like, okay, we have to get rid of the, the frothy hypothetical for what can you actually do? Um, the, you know, we're working on drafts of constitutions. We're also having to work on how do you phrase a ballot so that people can vote on something? Because the actual, how, how you structure and word things matters enormously, as well as the code for taking that ballot and putting it in front of people and counting votes. Uh, so there's a bunch of technical stuff on the vote counting side and the presentation, but then there's the language and the, and the logic of it. And how do you uh, present things in a, in a, clearly structured way so that a voter can make any sense of it because you don't want 92 different ballot formats. Trust me. You would much rather have like the third best format, but everybody uses it instead of the first, second and fourth all competing. You really want standardization here because it lowers cognitive load and increases voter participation. So these are all the many, many, many things we're working through on. In fact, I will give you a diagram. Just finished it last night. Um, you are the first person outside of um, a very select group in the, in my, my alliance staff have seen this and nobody else has. So this is the EOS constitution making process. And you'll see we start here on the left with a starting point. Uh, I'll zoom in. We have an interim constitution. We have many ideas about what a new constitution might look like, but no final merged copies, no community agreement on core questions like base layer arbitration. No settled format for ballots or agreed process for voting. <laughs> we don't know who the voters are or how to encourage voting. And I'm sure there's other things I could say, but that seemed like a good summary. Now, over here on the other side of the, um, you know, the project, if you will, we have an ending point. We hope to have an approved constitution based on a final merged copy. We've reached community agreement on core questions like base layer arbitration. We've settled format for ballots. We have an agreed process for voting and voters were informed and they participated. Okay, so how do you get from there to here? Well, that's the middle of the diagram. We're gonna need some activity streams. I, don't, I have three, but there could be any number. And there's gonna be obstacles that come up and for each obstacle, we need a countermeasure. And I'm not saying there's only five obstacles. I'm saying I put in five little icons for decoration, okay? Which <laughs> the numbers three and five are not magical, okay? There could be, you know, five activity streams and 87 obstacles, I, you know, whatever it is. The key is for every obstacle, you come up with a countermeasure. If it doesn't work, you replace it with another countermeasure and you keep going until you get where you're going. Uh, and this is a pretty standard sort of lean way of thinking about sort of, you know, natural project management. Uh, and this is what I'm hoping we work on this week in the Alliance work, actually, uh, is getting everybody to contribute their thoughts to what are the activities, you know, how do we get from here to there? What are the activity streams? What are the obstacles? How might we counter the, each obstacle? And this is going to be a decentralized project. <laughs> <laughs> if that doesn't make you go, what? Uh, you're not, you haven't done a project before. Yeah, agreed. So that's the short version of what I've been up to. No, it's, um, it looks yeah. exciting. Um, and I always, I always enjoy catching up because I always kind of get these insights with you, which is cool. See, I'm convinced that people absolutely will step up and do the work if we can agree on a framework and a structure. And it's the lack of a framework or a structure that people are like, oh, what do we do? What do we do? Uh, and often you get more creativity by, by constraining. You know, if I just say write a poem, you can be like, ugh. If I say write a limerick, well, oh yeah, it's like a certain number of syllables. Okay, haiku, oh, that I can do. It'll suck, but I can do it, right? Structure, creativity just explodes. I love the so, analogies. I love them. So, 
that's, I feel that's my role. That's the Alliance's role is to give people a place to go, a channel to tune into, a group conference call to join. And we are completely user driven on what we do. I noticed that. I still do pop in there all the time into the EOS Alliance chat there on Telegram. Once again, I'm going to make sure that I put in all the information below so people can see the kind of things that you guys are talking about. And it's interesting. I, you know, I think before I really got in there and started reading, I anticipated it would be dry, but you have a lot of uh, very intelligent people in there and some of which are, are characters. And it's, uh, it's always funny to kind of watch some, some many, but it's always, uh, it's always interesting to watch that kind of transpire. Yeah. Um, I want to, um, I just want to quickly circle back to kind of, you spoke a little bit about maturity of EOS um, a little bit. And I think that it's been, it's been an odd few months because I think that the market in general has been kind of in a lull. I think that's probably accurate to say. Crypto winter, a lot of folks are calling it. Yeah, which is, which is probably accurate. And I, I'm guess what I want to know from you is that, and this is sheer speculation rather, do you think that this is the calm before the storm? mainstream starting to see the benefits of blockchain and I, I, I'm, software. I'm convinced that the, the frothy excesses of 2017 and the first portion of 2018 were the collision of an oversupply of highly risk philic um, speculative money and an ever proliferating supply of shit coins manufactured to meet the absurd demand. It's like, shut up and take my money. Okay, that we will. Uh, and then people did. Um, and so at some point, the supply of, of absurdly optimistic, blind, stupid, enthusiastic money dries up. I mean, there's not an infant. So you can, inf you can make, you can always make another shit coin. You can't always find another million dollars. So the money has dried up. Um, We've, you know, the hype cycle is doing its thing. It's diving uh, correctly because the vast majority of ICOs are crap. And, um, you know, I don't know that prices do or don't recover when blockchain utility becomes more widespread because I don't know that token price and utility are all that tightly correlated. You could have a very useful uh, utility token that didn't necessarily have a high token price. I, I don't know enough to have a uh, useful opinion on that subject. Uh, I will point out that one of the most useful things in the world is water and you can buy water for a few pennies per acre foot. So, um, Time will tell, essentially, right? You know, I, 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 the only prediction I ever make about token prices is that they will fluctuate. And I'm mostly, I'm mostly proven right on that, although they haven't fluctuated very much lately. No, they haven't. It's kind of been, we've seen a lot of sideways action. But what we have seen is a lot of really interesting use cases um, and interesting yeah, technology side, which is what I'm actually interested in rather than the speculative nonsense side. Uh, it, it just been wonderful. We're seeing great advances in, in all number of, of areas, um, new projects coming online, new use cases coming online. Um, we've seen wax show up on the uh, blocktivity report for the first time. Uh, it's at number one right now and wax is apparently running on a fork of EOS, I think. So yeah, yeah, it yay. is. Yay. yay. Is raw. The software works. Uh, I want to, I kind of want to. Top four places on blocktivity are, you know, wax of an EOS fork, EOS mainnet itself, and then BitShares and Steemit, which are two graphene based products, which are the precursors to EOS. So we're seeing really high uh, usage, high utilization. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's encouraging. I want to pick your brain and just kind of get a little bit of an opinion piece. If, if you'll share it with me, I noticed that one thing that is definitely popping up a lot in EOS um, are a lot of these kind of, you know, gray black market, whatever you want to call them, however you want to word it, um, gambling kind of applications. Yeah. So interesting thing about um, gambling and uh, pornography are probably the two th uh, areas of human endeavor that are quickest to adopt new technologies, not the entire industry, but there's always some fringe player who's looking for an edge or a new thing. Um, they're not constrained by tradition and they're not all that constrained by legality uh, necessarily. They're happy to skirt corners, many of them. 
Uh, and so they are almost always the first to rush in. And I, I don't know that it's proven, but I believe that the success of VHS over beta back in when uh, video cassette tapes were a big deal, beta was clearly the superior technology, but the tapes were too short to fit a full film on. And they, they tried very hard to prevent um, adult movies from being distributed on beta. And VHS was like, use our stuff, use our stuff. And guess what one of the most prominent uses of home VCRs was, was to see stuff you couldn't see in movie theaters. A lot of adult, a lot of adult films. So um, the technology got a boost, arguably, I think, uh, from that. So did online commerce, one of the very first uses of online commerce on the internet when no one would ever put their credit card in a website. Oh, come on. That's, that's crazy talk. You can't trust websites. Uh, the, the first ones were adult sites. Um, because again, they're, they're out there willing to take risks most people won't take. Um, and I mean that in many different ways. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily virtuous, but it's an accurate description. Yeah. So while I'm not seeing much in the way of adult activity, you know, pornographic or, or whatnot, we're definitely seeing a lot of gambling. Um, it, and it's possible that that will actually be in some ways virtuous because maybe the gambling can be done on contracts that are audited and that the, the fairness of the gambling algorithms can be verifiable, which of course on non-blockchain sites, as far as I know, they absolutely cannot be. Yeah. So, you know, if you're one of these, I'm going to be really opinionated here. If you're one of these idiot gamblers, um, then, you know, at least, at least you'll have a, a fair shot as you lose your money over the long term. The odds favor the house. We always do. The only reason to be in gambling is if you own a casino. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or I mean, or perhaps um, some of these utility tokens. I know they're popular amongst traders. I, I won't lie to you. I have, inv I've invested in um, some of the tokens. I don't. You speculated. You've not invested in anything. You speculated. This is accurate. I have, um, I have, and I've, I've done quite well uh, because of it. I know I'm not a big gambler as such. When, when you crypto. buy tokens, on a, on a platform that has very high utility yeah. and, and has a clear like plan for that, that token to have meaning and use yeah. in, in strong tokenomics, I might call that an investment. Yes, absolutely. True. But when you're talking about, oh, EOS bet, I'll, <laughs> I'll, buy their, I'll buy their internal token because I can. <laughs> you, you don't know the fundamentals. They don't, they've not shared their business model with you. True. Um, probably don't know the founders. Uh, that's to me, that feels like on the, on the risk spectrum. Yes. On the high end is, I don't know what the cutoff is between speculation and investment, but that feels very speculative to me. I definitely have my, I agree. Hey, I agree. I have my projects that I, I love and that I hold anything kind of along the lines of what you're talking about. I buy into, I hold it. And it, for me, it's come hell or high water. This is what I've decided to invest in because, you know, and I won't get into like specifics because I don't think that's fair, but um, projects, you know, that I really enjoy and that I think really have a yeah. future I invest into long-term. I, I, I will exception for the strong block eventual yes. token. Yes. Of course. Of course we'll be. Of course. I, don't know what the heck, I won't say anything about it. <laughs> I will. This I will. is not investment advice. I'm not. You know, <laughs> This is not. This is not an offer to sell, nor a solicitation of an offer to buy anything. I love our talks. <laughs> I really do. It's so I've been trained to be scared. <laughs> well, it's good. You have probably to. every lawyer listening is like, "Yes, good, good job." <laughs> uh, well, it's, and somewhere out there is some really like living on the edge, you know, coin al almost scammer going, "What's wrong with you? Just say it." <laughs> no, I'm not do I'm not doing it. No, but yeah, gambling dApps have seen a lot of traction, and they've also proven um, a lot of things about the internal operations of of the EOS uh, mainnet. I mean, their ability to crank transactions through is phenomenal. See, uh, and we're already seeing. You know, they're learning. Oh wow, uh, we're using up a lot of CPU. We need to tweak performance. Yeah. Yay! That's what I love to hear. You know, uh, Dan Larimer's come back with several tweaks to. Um, the main net code to, you know, how Wasm is like compiled or interpreted or executed or certain routines to, to shave seconds off. I'm like, yes, that's what we want. It's good uh, stuff. 
Yeah, and of course, we're able, by the way, I note that we are able to release uh, uh, patches that don't change the intent of code. Yeah. If you change the intent of, of code or you change like a constitutional level thing, like a system smart contract in such a way that the Ricardian would be different, that would require uh, a, a, a referendum because you're changing the, the social contract. But if you just like shave a couple of milliseconds off a of routine, there's nothing in the Ricardian contracts that said you were promised to take a certain amount of time and now you changed your promise. So that, that is totally at the discretion of block producers to roll that out. Is that been and an so, issue? With people, uh, people have asked. People have asked about like, well, wait, are, aren't we? We're changing the system code. Do we need a referendum for that? I'm like, no, <laughs> we don't, because we have this agree a social contract that says that the intent of code is law, and if we ever we change intent, we need a referendum. But yeah. if we're not changing intent, we don't. Yeah. So if we change the inflation rate, right? I totally need a referendum for that. For sure. You know, change other block producers. Totally need. Yep. Absolutely. Change bot producer pay. You got to have referendum for that. Uh, there's a number of things that are in the Constitution or in the Ricardian contracts of the system contracts uh, that you absolutely would need a referendum for. But bug fixes, nope. Improvements in performance, nope. Some some additional new features. For, I'll give you one that was contentious. Um, the uh, increase in RAM, having sort of its automated slow increase in RAM uh, supply. What that was doing was taking something that's always been a discretionary thing for block producers. Every block producer lists how much RAM that he's, he's officially making available. He might have more on the system, but he's like telling the system, I've got this much that I'm willing to admit to. And then you can change that configuration anytime you want to. And they wrote a routine to automatically increment that by I think like one byte of memory per block or per round or something to slowly creep it up over the course of a year. Uh, and to take something you can do discre on a discretionary basis and make it automated, to me, I, you haven't changed anything. As a user, my experience doesn't change. No. Now, the RAM speculators were furious, but no one ever promised them they could speculate on RAM. No one promised to keep the price of RAM high for them. It's true. That's, that was speculation. Congratulations, you speculated. Good job. <laughs> I think if we make, if we, you know, impose a bunch of barriers to simple fixes that are going to make the system more efficient, it adds, um, it adds a bunch of red tape. And to I'm just pointing out that we've been able to put in a number of good fixes um, very rapidly, more quickly, I believe, than most other blockchains uh, comparable to us. And that ability to evolve fast is a massive competitive advantage in the blockchain space where everything is so slow once you go production. I mean, Ethereum, bless them. They don't know how to make decisions. And yep. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, they literally like, how do we achieve, cons how, do we, how do we make an agree? How do we come to like a social agreement on a change? They have like a carbon vote and some other stuff that they've invented. They, they literally in May had this massive multi-day, you know, governance meeting of like all their worldwide leaders of Ethereum got together for several days and their big findings. I was so excited because I thought, man, these guys are four years ahead of us. I'm gonna learn so much. Couldn't wait for their formal statement. Came out, we decided two things. Number one, we must figure out who our stakeholders are. And number two, we must figure out how to find out what they want. Seriously? <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're ahead of you on one of those. We've defined our stakeholders as, as, you know, token holders, one token, one vote. And we have the outlines of a referendum process, which will be in production here in, I'm guessing, a month or so, if not less. Yeah. Uh, so at that point, what they're dreaming of doing someday, we will have implemented, uh, which, again, puts us ahead of the curve in terms of fast uh, iterations. Uh, if you ever have a, a, a moment to look into, there's a guy, I think it was John Boyd, Colonel the first, it might have been Steve, I think it was John Boyd, last name B-O-Y-D. He was uh, an American uh, fighter pilot. Uh, right after World War II, uh, he became the, uh, the creator of something called the OODA loop, the observe, orient, decide, and act. And he trained American fighter pilots uh, how to think in the cockpit. Uh, and his doctrine led to American air dominance for decades. Uh, and it's still the state of the art for fighter pilots. And what, what he teaches you to do is separate out the idea of like, look at everything and observe, just let it all in 
and then orient. And orient is where you make sense of what is, what am I seeing? And in order to orient, you have to have mental models that you can say, is this like that? Or is it like this other thing? And the more mental models you have in your head, the more easily you can compare what you're seeing to something that makes sense. And that ability to make sense of the world gets you faster to the decide step and then the act step. And so if I can observe, orient, decide, and act while you're still orienting, I've just, through my action, changed your reality. And now you've got to go back and observe some more. Yeah. And so the, fa and so the faster you can go through the OODA loop, the faster you outpace your competitors. And in fact, you can completely paralyze them in some circumstances. Uh, and I think we are poised to do that with EOS. And that, that to me is tremendously exciting. It is. Uh, so. It is. I, I love the- Knock on wood. It's coming. Haven't it? Well, it's yeah. And I think that the, 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 the speed and regularity of the patches and the, and the small, but very significant improvements is a big deal. Um, you know, I think the- uh, Introduction of the Rex R E X. If it's done as a system uh, contract, is going to have to be voted in. If it's done as non-system, I think it could be just installed, um, probably. Uh, but I would like I would like the community to think about it and talk about it first, because yeah. um, that is a change to system behavior, yeah. uh, as opposed to you know Chintai, which does token leasing today, but it's third-party DAP. It's not part of the system. It's something somebody added, and you could do those any time you like. Yeah. What do you think of Chintai? Have you, I mean, have I mean you... very exciting. I don't know. I don't know it firsthand. I haven't used it. Um, my, my 76 tokens and I, or however many of I have right now. Uh, I'm sure. It's 76. <laughs> 78. I don't remember. Um, I could look, but it would be boring while you watched me. So let's just say I don't have a massive um, fund of tokens, um, but I could lease them out. Assuming anybody wanted a small number like that. Uh, and they're paying, you know, an APR of like, I think, I think I saw something like 20% or more for short term, uh, which is like, darn. It's, it, it moves with CPU, right? And when we have a CPU crisis, um, I haven't, I actually haven't used Chintai either. I have talked to, um, I have talked to David before and I'm like, I'm a fan of what they're doing. Um, but it's, you know, it's it adds such flexibility to the, to the platform because you know, one of the big worries was, oh, I'm a startup little DAP, and if my DAP gets successful, I'll use up all the CPU and all this network bandwidth, even if I can push the memory usage onto the user, which in some cases you can. Um, and, I'll, how I, and I'll be priced, I'll suddenly my very popularity will price me out of my ability to even run. Yeah. Uh, well, that's only true if you have to buy the tokens to get bandwidth, but if you can rent them or lease them to get your bandwidth for just in very short increments, yeah. uh, that becomes extremely affordable. And so you can experiment and, hey, wow, look, I'm popular. Ooh, look at all this money. Hmm, I think I'll buy some tokens for myself, but I'll keep leasing for a while uh, and pay my developers and whatever. Yeah. So th that to me gives flexibility. It gives people a chance to put their tokens to use yes. they might not otherwise be using. Um, and another important point, oh, I had it and I lost it. What was I going to say? Oh, um, there's some interesting ideas around truth bonds and giving people the ability to uh, put money where their mouth is in terms of you know, putting down a deposit saying, I claim the following to be true and here's money that says so. And if I'm wrong or lying, then you can take this money because it's attached to my assertion. That's kind of a powerful thing to say in, in blockchain because otherwise, like, yeah, you made a claim, but, you know, you could be lying and how would I know and how would I come back at you if you were? Well, this is a way of putting your money where your mouth is quite, quite literally. The downside is, number one, that, money, that, that becomes dead capital, hypothetically. And number two, the guys doing it weren't sure what they charge a fee. What do they do with that? And I suggested to them, take it to Chintai, lease it out. Take, take the revenue stream, split it with, you know, with some for you and some for the guy who's got the truth bond. You can put down your truth bond and make some little income off of it. It's true. The truth bond guys are also taking a, a slice of that as well to pay for their trouble. Uh, it, because blockchains by themselves don't create trust. We still have to use them correctly. True, true. I want to, um, just because we're jumping around anyway, so we might as well keep with that program. I want to ask you about the worker proposal fund. <laughs> We're just kind yes. of, aware, but it's great. I love it. What's going on with the um, worker proposal fund? What's kind of the new? Uh, I'm not following it too terribly closely, but my understanding, sorry, I got it. 
no stress today and i'm still i'm still <laughs> playing um uh worker proposal guys um are working on the language they want to put in front of the voters for a ballot to ask for um their package uh, whatever the exact wording of the package is the last i heard they were going to propose that a, a, a vote for yes would take a certain number of tokens out of the savings fund and put it into this WPS fund for them to spend according to their program that they're, that they enumerate and that the entire balance of the savings account would be burned. That one vote. Yes. Would do both of those things. And I think that would be very attractive to a lot of people because that savings account is a big honeypot and it's a little scary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's one of the reasons people are very uh, leery. I think rightly so very cautious yeah. uh, of the WPS. And uh, so, yeah, a, a one-time burn drops it to zero. It keeps accumulating, which is fine. And then in a few, you know, weeks or months or whatever, uh, you know, if they do a good job with the first batch, we'll probably trust them for another batch. And if they don't, we won't. Uh, yeah. Maybe we'll find another group. I think it's really important that we just experiment with things. We've got to find out what works. And the only way to find out what works is to try things. Very true. So I'm, I'm, I'm really... I've sat in on several of their meetings. I'm really impressed with how seriously they're taking the, the need to make the WPS as responsible and as serious as they can. And they know that this is like the first time you do anything as a big deal. Yeah, it is. Uh, and so they, they really want to do it in the, the best possible way. Uh, and they put a, just a ton of thought and a ton of heart into it. And I really respect that. Uh, and I hope the voters, uh, I hope what they put in front of the voters is acceptable to voters. Um, I'm not saying it is acceptable. I haven't looked at it yep. uh, closely. Uh, I will, again, I'm EOS Alliance. I can't have opinions, right? Of course. Of course. Uh, you know, I can't be stumping out. Vote for, you know, <laughs> Fred Johnson for mayor. It's like, I'm not doing that. I want to move on to another kind of theoretical question about EOS in general. I think that we're seeing some interesting new use cases. One that I'm surprised we're starting to see a little bit of, but we haven't seen a lot of, is um, supply chain come to blockchain because I think like in terms of. Yeah. What's up with that? So um, I, I did some supply chain work uh, back in the day. I uh, worked for a, uh, God, it was fun too. It was one of these uh, big database projects I used to be on. I used to do enterprise database stuff for Oracle and IBM and anyway. Um, and this one was uh, a logistics firm, a specialty logistics firm, and they were integrating air routes to their ground and in, in sea routes. And so I was like thrown in the middle of the data models of all of those things to try to unify them. And I just got to like sit there and marinate on those data models for several very interesting and frustrating weeks. Uh, it is a ton of work. And if you don't want to completely throw away your existing system and build a brand new logistic system on a blockchain, which you could do, um, if you already have an existing system you don't want to scrap, then you have to figure out, well, how do I put hooks into a blockchain to make it helpful to me while still maintaining my main system? Um, boy, what a good question. Good, good luck with that. I have ideas. I can show you some ideas, um, but I don't have answers to that. I, I do think that um, long-term, the, the uh, logistics world is going to be I mean, like I and everybody else on the planet think that logistics and blockchain are kind of made for each other. And sure. surely at some point we will see, you know, uh, things, things come together. I hope so. But, um, you know, don't call me Shirley. And uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't know when that's going to show up. Oh, I do want to show you all here on screen. I've shown this just a very few times before. I think it's interesting. Please do. Um, it's a way of thinking about, um, using um, blockchains specifically to uh, uh, as a, as a it's a way of recording key moments in existing workflows. And so, let me find my controls for sharing screens here. What do you think is missing out? You think there's some industries that should be on blockchain that just haven't realized the potential yet? And so what do you think some of those could potentially be? Like, of course, we've got supply chain. Um, I talked to a gentleman who was in the middle of doing a project, which was kind of tracking of 
merchandise, which is essentially supply chain. Uh, yeah, provenance. Yeah, it's it's not quite as heavy of a lift, I imagine. I think uh, yeah. as far as supply chain, but it's it's a big deal. Like, is is there something that you're like, why are you guys not doing this? Why are you guys? Not, is there anything well, that sticks out to you? That, they are actually. Yeah. Well, well, they are. We just don't. They just haven't, you know, gone production on mainnet. It could be production on a, on their private blockchain, which is a weird concept, right? Because it's like, if it's private, then do I own all the block producers? And if I own all the block producers, then I control what they all say, in which case, why don't I just have one block producer and call it a database? You know? Absolutely. So, so um, let's, let's just, I, I have thoughts and answers, but I'm not sharing them with you right now because that's too deep a dive into, into one use case. Um, let's just say that there's a lot, of thinking had to be done there. Uh, a really good use case that I, I still love is um, IRIO, I-R-Y-O, the yes. uh, medical records, because they don't store the medical records on a blockchain, they store the access control list on the blockchain and they use zero knowledge proofs and other ways to keep your medical records safe and, and under your control. I think that is a huge step towards self-sovereign identity and owning your own data in a way that's gonna be very powerful. But I promised you a workflow thought. See what we have here. So let's see, uh, you can extract, uh, abstract any workflow I claim into these four fractal stages. Number one, initiate. You got an asker who asks for something and that initiate phase or stage ends with a notice of a request. Then the next phase or sorry, stage is negotiate. Then both parties are doing that. That ends with the notice of agreement. Uh, then there's the perform stage where the performer does the thing that was agreed. And that per stage ends with a notice of completion. And then the accept stage where the asker then accepts what was done. And that ends with a notice of acceptance. And of course, each of these can include sub workflows in a sort of a fractal pattern. Uh, like we're in the middle of negotiation and I need to initiate a request to one of my helpers to help me negotiate better. And so I initiate, I negotiate with them. They perform, I accept what they know. Oh, thank you for the help. And then I can negotiate my main loop better. So, Here's the asker initiating, then the, the two of them negotiate, the performer performs, and then the asker accepts or not. Um, and this is actually from something uh, by Winograd and Flores. They published this in 1987 uh, called Language Action Perspective. And this was, mo this was a model they built specifically to uh, enable autonomous software agents to exchange information with each other and ask each other to do things. I feel like we're getting some insight into something that um, <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of pulling random things here, but I feel Dude, like is he, what, here's, here's my thesis. My thesis are, is that blockchain is full of people who don't have good solid computer science background and haven't done things for 10 or 20 years out in the real world. They're yeah. like, Oh, blockchain is everything and everything in blockchain is brand new and no problem has any roots in prior work. It's like stupid, yeah. stupid. Oh, governance is completely, you know, governance comes, you know, started in 2008 with Satoshi. No, no. governance is 5,000 years old or more. Come on. Since we're dragging knuckles. You know, so let's not, <clears throat> just because you don't know that there's a model out there doesn't mean there's not a model out there that would help you enormously in your development. Go look. Yeah. So I, kind of, I kind of did a face palm with the whole DAC idea because, you know, upon, like, I, I was like, this is so cool. This is a great new idea. And meanwhile, you know, DACs have been essentially, you know, um, decentralized autonomous government's been around since the days that we first learned to lay fires in, in essence, right? In very basic, pure form. So. Although not automated. No, not no, this is true. Some of the, the All right. So let me take you around the loop the rest of the way. Let's do it. So here we are. There's the four steps. And I'm going to show that these, I'm going to put these key documents in here and they overlap the stage that they, that they terminate, right? So initiate ends with this request object or, or record on a blockchain, maybe. Yeah. Certainly the agreement should be on a blockchain because otherwise, what did we agree to? Um, and then the notice of completion, I would like us all to know that I, hey, I, not only did I say I was done, but you have access to the fact that I said I was done. Don't tell me I never told you. Here, proof that I told the world. Maybe it's encrypted only you can see it, but the fact that I said it, it's boom, timestamp right there. Uh, and then of course the notice of acceptance and maybe it's not accepted, in which case you get your arbitrator in there right around the acceptance phase, probably most likely time you'll see arbitrator show up. 
And I will furthermore say not only is the majority of arbitration likely to happen in, during acceptance because you, you choose not to accept. It's like, yes, you did. You sent me a notice of completion, but dude, it sucks. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, so let's, let's look at initiation. The asker might be responding to some standing offer. So this we might have to just unify, initiate, negotiate. Maybe the, the performer has some like insert a quarter and get a candy bar. That's like a vending machine. So there's no negotiation. You just like in it to initiate is to accept the standing offer and make an agreement. Boom like that. Right. And so that would change it very slightly. Um, notice that the performer in particular may become an asker and open multiple sub loops. You know, during negotiation, I might ask requests of my staff. Hey, help me out here. <clears throat> during performance, I'm very likely to have subcontractors. So a bunch of open loops there, all of which can be recorded on chain. Right. We can model this out. It's a very flexible, generic, reusable pattern. Um, I would note that you're, as a performer, all your leverage is during negotiate, so don't rush to yes. <laughs> I used to do that a lot. The bargain is acceptable to all parties. Um, and then during perform, you will often find that your asker doesn't respond to your questions because you, like, the agreement didn't specify enough and you have to get clarifying questions. And if they don't answer them, you lose time. So during negotiation, you should specify that the asker must respond to your reasonable requests in a reasonable amount of time. And if they introduce delays through their tardiness, it's their fault, not yours. So word to the wise there. So if you're like, oh, I need to put up the wallpaper now as a contractor, you have to pick the wallpaper. Hello, you have to pick the wallpaper. Hello, <laughs> this is the third I'm you know, leaving voicemails. I need you to pick the wallpaper. I can't move forward on the project. I got people tied up. Come on. Let's... And this happens all the flipping time in software and everywhere else. So, you know, there's these communication loops that aren't shown in the main loop, but they certainly exist. Absolutely. Decision, subcontractor loops, and so on. Um, and here's, I did the vending machine as a separate diagram. Um, so anyway, there's the, there's the big, the big loop there. I feel like I'm getting insight into something maybe I shouldn't be, but I don't want to, I don't want to ask. No, this is from 1987. This is okay. Okay. I, <laughs> I, I don't invent things. I, I read the, I read the greats and I, I pay attention and take notes. Winograd and Flores, Eleanor Ostrom, um, Buchanan and what's his name who wrote, um, calculus of consent, uh, Thomas Schelling who wrote, um, strategy of conflict. Uh, best book on game theory I've ever read. Every time I speak to you, I feel like I need to read more. You know, oh, I can, man, it's endless. See, I, but see, public blockchains are this intersection of so much stuff that has to be integrated to work, right? It's not just computer science. It's computer science plus trust plus if you want to do the governance, you have to have social stuff. Absolutely. Uh, you know, truth bonds. Things that, well, you know, those exist out in the real world. You know, you have, you have a contractor who's licensed, bonded, and insured. Uh, if they're not licensed, bonded, and insured, you might not want to hire that contractor. Why? Because the licensing, bonding, and insuring help you feel some safety in case they go weird on you. True. Uh, I, um, I have so many other questions that I want to ask you. I think I'm going to, I want to, I'm going to get a few more um, for you, but I, we have to do this. We have to do this more often, man. <laughs> like, hey, I'm here every day. You know what I mean? I always enjoy my, I really do. Um, it's on you, man. Make it happen. I will. I promise you I will. Uh, just as kind of like a, a little bit of insight. Do you have friends outside of the industry? Like, of course. I don't have, have friends. I don't I'll have. you right there. I'll just shut cut the story. <laughs> no friends. Thomas Cox has no I friends. I just work. I just work. <laughs> you know, it's, it's sad because I kind of find, I find myself doing the same thing, um, but it's beautiful. I Coworkers are nice to me. I think that almost counts. <laughs> it counts. <laughs> my wife's my best friend. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I get it. Do you clear? Do you do you communicate with anybody outside the blockchain industry? Like, let's get real here. When you start talking about, is EOS, there something outside the blockchain industry? Very little. I don't I've, know. I've heard there. There must be because I, I was there for years. There, it must still be out there. What is life exactly? And how do I? How do I buy that token? I oh. have. T I, I'm working two jobs. Okay, I'm full time with Strongbox, and I'm half time with the EOS Alliance. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I suspect the people at the grocery store are probably not in blockchain, but I never actually bring it up with them. <laughs> I go in, I buy things, and I leave. I'm an introvert. Yeah. You, uh, 
honestly, like I wouldn't, it's very weird because I, I wasn't necessarily, but of course I've got a few roles in the industry now. The EOS has become my full-time job, which is both, it's more of a blessing than a curse, but it's also a curse in the same sense that I have gone from being very extroverted to um, introverted or maybe extroverted from my computer. What? Uh, well, you're, see, you're focusing yourself, you're, you're, you're sacrificing some things in order to focus on other things. And that's the test of maturity. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, part of, that's part of growing up as part of, of uh, if you're going to achieve any kind of uh, what I might call success, you know, progress towards a worthy outcome. Yeah. Uh, you have to let go of things and you can mourn those things. But I don't know of any path forward that it involves not letting go of something. Can you talk to my wife for me? Uh, well, if you're, not, if you're not letting, if you're letting go of her, I don't want to be in that loop. I'm not letting go of her by any stretch. Okay. Are you, do, you have, do you have date night? Do you have an end to your work day? Uh, do you spend quality time with her? I do. Probably not as much okay. as I should. I do, we do have date night. Do you know the five love languages and do you know which hers are? I, I do actually. I've read the book. It's a good book. So good man. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I do. I do and I have. Highly recommend it. Yeah. Good book indeed. I've read, you know, I, like I, I have read a lot. I just clearly haven't read as much as you have. And I wish that I had more time to do so. I, it's how I hide from the world as I, I go read a book. Yeah, I believe it. Or several. Uh, I'm going to peel just a, a couple more questions and I'm going to, I'm going to send you off to the world to, uh, to do your thing. I think, um, here's one that I think is kind of interesting and I'd love to hear your insight on and any that I don't chat with you here about, I'll just move over to the next session that we do. But um, an economic collapse, would that be good for cryptocurrency or not so much? Uh, an economic collapse wouldn't be good. It's like anything comes after that, it's just a wrong sentence, okay? An economic, it's like, Sorry. Would a world <laughs> pandemic be good for <laughs> that? Would, good. That's a weird sense of good. Right? I get Global it. genocide be good for coffin sales. Well, I, kind of, who would be around to enjoy it? Um, so, uh, I, I will say that there's lots of things that could be good for, for, for crypto. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm really what's, I'm into what's good for people. True. That, that's really my focus. Um, but, and I'll accept the premise of your, of your, uh, of your question. I was yeah. listening to, um, a wonderful podcast by, um, Laura Shin. She does two podcasts, one called Unconfirmed, one called Unchained. They're both wonderful. Highly recommend it. It's mandatory listening, I would say, for anybody in blockchain. Uh, and she was interviewing somebody who was, he asked that exact question. And he said, well, it depends on what kind of downturn we had. Because this kind of downturn, no. But this kind of downturn, yes. I'm like, there's kinds of downturns? Cool. I didn't, okay. I'm like, taking notes. And I should go back and listen to it and remember what he said. I don't want to misquote him. But um, so I would say, Go listen to the Laura Shin episode because that guy seems to know what he's talking about. And I know I don't. Uh, and um, I guess I, I'm much less interested in what is good for crypto and much more interested in what is good for people. And I think crypto is good for people. Me too. Because crypto, cryptocurrencies, crypto technology uh, gives us more options. It lets us detach from fiat currencies. Um, where appropriate. It gives us the ability to transact over long distances in secure ways without intermediaries. It gives us the ability to create new models of business we haven't even thought of yet. Uh, and all that's tremendously exciting. I think if, if I had time to really uh, sit down and think of my question and realize um, who I was speaking with, I probably would have rephrased it a little bit along the lines of, do you think that perhaps an economic... I'm fine. Don't worry about it. Just no. ask it the fun way, and then we'll fight about it. Well, give you <laughs> it's like, more fun this way, all right? You always hear these questions. You always hear these people pop up like, you know, what's it going to take for crypto to hit mass adoption? Some people would imply that perhaps a downturn in the economy. How about a usable interface and a wallet that doesn't suck and some way to manage my keys that doesn't fill me with fear? True. It's like, yes. You're, you're a master of your own domain, but if you, you know, lose this electronic file, you are a pauper. <laughs> Wh what? <laughs> Buh. And if it's stolen, you're a pauper. <laughs> uh, but, uh, it kind of, industry can't even give me a secure PC, okay? Yes. Where am I supposed to store this file? I can stick it on a hardware wallet, great. Um, what if that fails or is stolen or destroyed in a fire? Yeah. These three of them? In, you know, to put one in geosynchronous orbit? I can't afford this. Yep. Come on, work with me here. 
So right. yeah. that's why exchanges are so popular is they give you at least some sense of security and an easier user interface and somebody to call for tech support, uh, which doesn't always work, but at least can help some things. Uh, you want mass adoption, make it mass adoptable. Yes. Okay. Study the uh, diffusion of innovation, right? And you, you look at how um, innovations move through a population. There's always this cutting edge people. That's us, by the way, who will like, wow, look, it's blockchain. I'll compile that. It's like, dude, most people can, won't compile things. Okay. It's, if you say you have to compile it, no mass adoption, no mass, no, no, no. Okay, and then there's the early adopters that are like right after the cutting edge and they're like pretty edgy and they're willing to try, they'll put up with crappy user interfaces because it's interesting. And then there's this chasm and Crossing the Chasm is a book that talks about getting from the early adopters to like mainstream yep. and it has to have a good interface. It's got to be manageable. It's got to be secure. It's got to be friendly. There's got to be an 800 number. Um, it's got to have, you know, it's got to degrade gracefully. There's got to be a, you know, 30 day money back guarantee. It has to work with my other stuff. Uh, and, and we have none of that, okay? And so what will, what will make crypto mainstream is that. Do the work. Make it mainstream a bull. Make it usable by normal humans. It's safe. That, that, it's safer and much, uh, as safe as a bank or more. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you will begin to see it adopted quite significantly. And you'll see it adopted first probably in third world countries where they are unbanked. Because to go from my current bank to this new crypto bank might be a stretch, but if I have no bank, boom, give me that crypto bank. Uh, just same way we see, uh, I had a chance to lecture at Harvard not long ago. I love saying that. I just dropped that in conversations randomly. Of course. I went to the University of Chicago. We have a Harvard complex because you know, we think we're just as good as them, but they have all the PR. <laughs> Everyone knows Harvard. University of Chicago, is that, is that a state school? No, no, damn it. It's one of the finest research universities on the planet. Nobody knows that. So I got to the chance to lecture at Harvard on blockchain. And uh, as part of the deal, they let us sit in on these other lectures, one of which was by, uh, I want to say, Clayton Christensen, mm -hmm. uh, super sharp guy. Uh, and he talked about this idea of innovation and uh, talked about a breakthrough idea um, that had made a massive difference. And it was how to get refrigeration into rural India because there's no refrigeration in rural India because there's no infrastructure in rural India. They don't have reliable electricity. If you took a regular refrigerator out there and it broke down even a little bit, there's nobody to repair it. There's no supply chain of parts or, or a trained technician. So it's like, Oh, here's this expensive, fragile thing. I'll take it out somewhere where there's very, you know, unreliable power and it breaks real quick. That failed, which is why there's no refrigeration. Right. And so some guys came up with this old technology right? Just like I showed you an old model from Winogran and Flores, this old technology. It's a chip. It's a silicon chip that uses some weird uh, process. You pump electricity through it. It gets hot on one side and cold on the other. It moves heat across the surface of the chip. And if you stack them, you can get it really hot on one side, really cold on the other. And you can make, you know, insulate a box, really good insulation, put the cold side inside the box and you can make a refrigerator. And yeah. it's more, it's, technically more expensive like per unit of whatever than you know our coil operated you know one in your house when you got it to rural india it's the only thing that works and so they've made these little they sit you can stick on the back of a scooter you can carry it around by hand you only need electricity for a couple hours a day to keep it cool like for 24 hours it's really well designed and now they're finding people can now build businesses built on top of refrigeration so not only are they selling thousands, tens of thousands of units industry they're making life better. And now they're building follow on industries yeah. that require refrigeration that literally couldn't exist without that building block technology. And so they're getting traction where others couldn't because they went to where there were people who would have loved to have been customers, but can't be served by the current uh, incumbents. And so if you want to disrupt banks, go where the banks aren't. Yeah. You want to disrupt fiat currency, you don't start in the U.S. where people are pretty happy with their fiat currency, right? You go to people who have very unstable currency or no currency or too many currencies or problems with banking or whatever. Uh, and that's where you're going to get the widespread adoption. Just like uh, Africa has leapfrogged the world by not bothering with landlines and going straight to cell phones. True. They're going to go straight to crypto banking. I'm, con I'm convinced of it. Africa will be the, the global uh, mecca 
uh, for for crypto banking. I'm guessing. I, I think my first right. prediction here on this entire show. <laughs> Thomas, my friend, we've been uh, we've been talking for a while. Um, so I will I'll let you go about your day. I really do appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. It's always so much fun and. I always really enjoy our, I really just enjoy, enjoy our chats, enjoy catching up. Enjoy you say that, but you don't do very many of them. What's up with that? No, I know. I'll get on it. I it's promise. on you. It's on I know. You. Life has been insane. Like I went from, you know, all of a sudden now I'm working on different projects that I really love and, and, uh, I know you poor guy. I know that's terrible, right? Um, no, it's a dream come true, but I just, I need to start carving out more time to uh, do these engaging talks because I do. Yeah. And it's about the sacrifices. I'm telling myself that as I'm telling you that I too need to sacrifice certain things and like Absolutely. not goof off so much, have a little more discipline. Yeah. I get it. <sighs> constant growth, my friend. Constant growth. <laughs> I will hit you up very soon to do another one. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you so much. It's been, it's been a pleasure as always. And I will talk to you soon, sir. Ciao.